this video, what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to create a virtual machine in Azure using Terraform. You'll see how to create the basics of that virtual machine, but also we're going to look at how to make it dynamic. And in addition, we're going to look at how you can configure an application to it using Cloud in it. Now we're going to do all of this from Terraform. It's kind of pretty straightforward, I think. But if you've never used Terraform before, if you've never seen it, you've never touched it, then there is a Terraform Basics video which kind of digs into the basics of that workflow. And you can see the description of that in the link below. But for now, assuming everything's good, you're ready to go, let's have a look and let's start digging in. So in Terraform, when you're interacting with a cloud like Azure, what you need to do is you need to add it as a provider. So the provider is a, is a kind of a, a plugin that interacts between the Terraform configuration and the APIs of Azure. So on my screen here, what I have is the documentation for the Azure provider. Now, in order to add this to Terraform, what we do is we're going to add this to a Terraform block. So if just by clicking on that link there, you can see there is the block that I, I need. Let's just add that to the configuration and then Let's kind of explain what's going on here. So I'm just adding this to a file called main.tf here. The first thing to notice is the Terraform block. And the Terraform block is where you kind of write which providers your application configuration is using. This is not required in Terraform, but it is good practice. Because what you're doing is you're pinning the version of a provider. So in this instance here, HashiCorp Azure RM, to the version 3.1.1.6. And why that's important is, the Terraform provider can change. So some of the attributes may change. So it's possible that your configuration that you wrote a couple of months ago drifts away from the current version of the provider. By pinning the provider, what you can do is you can ensure that that change is managed by you when you want to kind of make those changes. Now, one thing I will say, I would always recommend you to kind of keep your provider to the latest version. You always want it on the latest released version. That way, all of the latest bugs have been squashed and all of the latest features and resources have been added. Now, the second block here is this provider block. Now, the provider block here allows you to configure certain elements of the Azure provider. So let's take a look at some of those options. So if I just scroll down here, we'll be able to see an example. So we have an example there and it's kind of showing you some of the, some of the options. Now, the, the kind of the options that you're allowed to configure with, well, you have this features block, which can be used to customize the behavior. Now, this is a, a required block. We have to add it, but we don't have to put any values in it. We'll, we'll kind of see that in a second. The, the client ID, which is the, the kind of the client ID for authenticating against the Azure API. Subscription ID and tenant, again, those things are required for authentication. And then obviously we, we have things like the client certificate or the client secret. Now, in addition to being configuring those in the provider block, what you can also do is set those with environment variables. So for example, here for the client secret, we can set that to an environment variable arm client secret. It's always better to keep those things external to your Terraform configuration. You don't want to be hard coding client secrets and details like that inside of your, your configuration. Because if you accidentally leak that, if you accidentally commit that to a public GitHub, somebody else has got your API credentials, that's not going to leave you in a good place. But we're going to see how you can do this, how you can configure those environment variables, how you can keep the credentials safe and secure, and, and kind of keep everything nice and neat and tidy. First things first, let's add that features block. IntelliSense for the Terraform provider is actually saying, well, hey, you know, you've got two fluid blocks specified. You need one block for, for Terraform, and that is the, the features block. So we can just put features in here as an empty block. We don't need to, to kind of add anything in there when we're not really interested. We're just satisfying the, the requirements of the provider there. So that's done. What we can do now is kind of have a look at that authentication process. So how do we create the credentials that Terraform needs to authenticate with Azure? So the environment variables that need to be set so that Terraform can use the Azure API are these ones here that I've got on my screen. So I need ARM client ID, I need ARM subscription ID, the tenant ID, and ARM client secret. Now you may already have these, but you may not. I don't. So the way that I authenticate against Azure is that I just log in through the console. Now by logging in through the console, I'm just using my username and password. 
But in order to, to be able to authenticate as a, as a kind of an application and on behalf of Terraform, we need these four details. Let's have a look at how we can get those. So I've just opened up my Azure console. In order to, to create the credentials that Terraform needs, the first thing I need to do is add an application. And I do that in the Microsoft Entra ID section of the console. If I scroll down on the left-hand side here, you'll see that this is app registrations. So by registering an application, what I can then do is assign it permissions and then generate the client ID and the client secret that Terraform needs. So the first thing to do is to create a new registration. So I'm just clicking the new registration button here, and I'm just going to call this Terraform Basics example. And I'm just kind of selecting the, the first option. So it's, it's the kind of this single tenant, and I can ignore all of those other things there. I'm just hitting register. So now that we've created the application, what we need to do is assign permissions to it. So we do that from the subscription. So I open up my subscription here. My subscription is called Terraform Test. And what I need to do is I need to click on the access control section here. Now I'm going to click add, and I'm going to add a role assignment. Now the, the kind of the permissions are, are very kind of granular. So there's a, there's a lot of different options. And, and the best thing that you can do when you're creating a role for Terraform is to make sure that it only has the permissions that it absolutely needs. To keep things nice and simple, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add the, the contributor role. So this is a privileged role that I'm accessing here from the privileged administrator roles tab. And I'm going to select contributor. I'm pressing next. And then what I'm going to do is assign that to the application that I just created earlier. So we're going to select the members. We got the little box that pops up here. We are going to search for Terraform and we are going to find it here. There we go. So we have Terraform basics example. I'm selecting that. I'm just going to then press next. Uh, we're going to just make it permanent. And then eventually I'm going to click there, review and assign. So I've created the application. I've assigned the permissions to that application. What I now need to do is fetch the credentials for it. Where do we get those from? Let's have a look. So I'm going to go back to, to home and I'm back over to Antra ID. I'm going to choose my, my application. So I'll go back to my, my app registrations there and I'm choosing my Terraform Basics application. Now, if you see here on the left-hand side, what we have is certificates and secrets. So I'm clicking that and I want to generate a new client secret. So new client secret, I am just going to set this for 90 days. I don't need anything too, too big. And what you can see there is the client secret that's been, been created. Now you've got a secret ID and a value. What I want is the value. So I'm just going to grab that. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste that into my one password. So this is the ARM client secret. So where do we get the ARM client ID from? Well, we can get that if we go back to our applications. If I just click on overview, you can see here that we have the, the application client ID. So we can grab that, copy that again to the clipboard and pasting that into one password. And that, that is my ARM client ID. I also need the tenant ID. Well, the tenant ID, again, I can grab from here. I'm just going to, to grab that. So we have the client ID, we have the tenant ID, we have the client secret. What we need finally is the subscription ID. So to order and get the subscription ID, I can just click on the subscriptions and you can see there that I have my Terraform test and there's my subscription ID. So again, I'm just going to copy that and I'm just going to paste that into one password. So now I have all of those details. I can start populating the environment variables. Now what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to use one password. You don't have to use one password. I use it because of convenience. I use it because I use it on my desktop machine and because it allows me to keep secrets like my Azure credentials or my AWS or my GCP credentials nice and safe. If you want to kind of use this approach, then 1Password has a command line tool, which actually allows you to directly pull the credentials out of 1Password 
and automatically inject them into a fireable script like I have here. And the, the way that I do that is I just use the, the as I say, the one password command line. Now I could just manually paste these into this script here. So there's no reason at all that I couldn't just set my export, let's have a look, arm client ID, and then set that to a value. So if I grab that from one password and just grab my client ID, and if I paste it into there, you know, I can set those values like that. The thing you've got to remember is if you're setting any form of environment script, so you're setting anything like that, make sure that they're in your Git ignore. Do not check these things into GitHub because somebody will be stealing your resources. I've got all of those set, so I'm good to go. The next thing that we want to look at is how we can go about creating the virtual machine. So before we go and start creating the virtual machine, the first thing we want to do is run Terraform in it. So Terraform init is going to download our Azure provider and it's going to store it locally so that we can use it. So Terraform init, running that there, it's reaching out to the Terraform registry and just downloading and installing the provider. Now let's have a look at the virtual machine configuration. So I have the docs here and the resource that we're going to create is called Azure Linux Virtual Machine. So what this allows me to do is create a VM inside of Azure. Now, if I scroll down here, I'm going to see an example. So the example here is creating a resource group. It will create a virtual network, a subnet, a network interface, and finally the virtual machine. These are all the components that I need in order to be able to create my, my VM. So let's just copy and paste this example into our code, and then we can make some slight changes to it. All right, first things first. So the resource group, the resource group is kind of a container for all of the resources that I'm going to create inside of, of Azure. I'm just going to leave the name as example resources, but I will change the name here. And I'm going to change this to open web UI. So the name that's referenced on the stanza block here is not the name that will be created inside of Azure. It's the referenceable name that I can use inside of Terraform. So I'm going to update all of those other areas of the example. I'm just going to change the names for them here. And of course, I'm also going to have to change the names of the interpolated variables as well. Let's take a quick look at this, actually. So when we see a reference like this in, in Terraform, it's quite often called interpolation. So the value location there is going to come from the resource group stanza or the resource group resource from here. Now, what Terraform is doing by also having these links like this is it's controlling the order of which resources are created. So by referencing the location from the resource group in the virtual network, I can ensure that the resource group will be created before the virtual network. So I don't have to manually control the order. The order of which you put resources in a file in Terraform doesn't really matter. You can have multiple files across a directory. You can have all your resources in different orders. The order is based on what Terraform determines it needs to do when it's building a graph of resources. And that graph is by those references. So let's just finish up this example. Let's just kind of rename everything here, and then we can go ahead and hopefully create that virtual machine. So I'm just changing all of the names there, open web UI, and then we'll take a little bit more of an in-depth look at what's going on. All right, so that's all the names changed. And this is just from that example that I've just cut and pasted. I haven't changed anything else yet. Let's have a look at what's going on. So we're going to create the resource group. A virtual machine needs to be attached to a network. So we're going to create a virtual network. Now, a network requires that there is a subnet. So again, we're just going to create the, the subnet here. So our network's address space is, is quite broad. We're using 10.0.0 16. And then for the individual subnet, we're, we're kind of using a much smaller portion of that. We're going to create that as 10 as 0, 2. Then what we need to create is a network interface. So the network interface is added to the virtual machine. The network interface you can see here is referencing the subnet. And we're setting that we want a private IP address for this allocated dynamically. Then we have the virtual machine. So the virtual machine, well, this is going to be created inside of Azure and we're going to call it example machine. We have to add it to the resource group and the location. 
and we're going to look at the size. Now, the size here we're setting as standard F2. Let's make this a little bit more efficient. We're going to use a smaller virtual machine that's kind of cheaper for doing some tests. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change this to standard A2, and I'm going to use V2. So the admin username, this is the, the username that we are going to, to use whenever we want to authenticate to the virtual machine. I'm going to call this Open Web UI. The network interface, that is the reference network interface that we created just earlier here. And then we're going to add an administrator SSH key. Now the username needs to be the same. So we're just going to change that to Open Web UI and then the public key path. So if you don't have a, a private key and a public key part for accessing machines, GitHub or anything like that, there are tutorials on the internet where you can create this. I have my SH key already on my machine. The public part is actually in temp. So I'm just going to change the location to that and we're going to load that. Now, if you look at this here, we're, we're using this function file. Now I will dive into functions in a little bit more depth later on. But what file means is it's just going to load that public key and it's going to assign it to the public key property there. Then we've got the disk and the source image. Now the source image here is using uh, Ubuntu 22. We want to change this. I don't want to use Ubuntu. What I want to use is Debian. So let's have a look at how we can reference that Debian. So how do I reference that source image without having to hard code any of the values? So what I can do is use a data source block. Now a data source allows me to read information from Azure or from the anything that the provider is connected to and to be able to retrieve those values. A data source inside of the Azure provider we already have is called the Azure Platform Image. Now what this allows me to do is it allows me to search the marketplace catalog for platform images and to be able to return the details so that I can then use that inside of my virtual machine. Now, the example here that we're going to copy is just using Azure um, RM platform image. And you can see that I require the location, the publisher, the offer, and the SKU. Now, these details, where we can get those from, we can find those inside of the, the marketplace, but we can also use the Azure CLI to look those up. Let's see how we can do that for Debian 11. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a command on using the, the AZ CLI tool. So the AZ CLI, I'm using VM image list. I'm going to output to a table. And what I want to do is filter on Debian 11. And I want to get all of the latest images. So let's see what comes back here. So this is output quite a few images. We can see the, the sort of the dailies there. What we want is a just a standard Debian 11. So let's just back scroll up here. And we can start seeing that we've got things like Debian 11, got the version and the offer. So the offer is Debian 11, the publisher is Debian, and the SKU is 11. So I just want the latest. So we're going to copy this data block here, and then let's paste that into our application. So let me just scroll up to the top here. OK, so I paste that data element in there, and I'm just going to change the name of it to make it consistent with everything else. So we're just going to call it Open Web UI. Now, the location we've got hard coded there is Western Europe. Again, we can use that reference. So we're going to use the uh, Azure RM resource group, Open Web UI, and then we're going to use the location. The publisher, well, the publisher uh, we're going to use from that marketplace lookup is Debian. The offer, this is going to be the Debian 11. And the SKU, what we want, is 11. So what's going to happen is the data element is going to use these details. It's going to look up that marketplace image and it's going to fetch me the, the most recent version that I can use. I can then use those inside my, uh, my resource. So let, let's add that. I'm just scrolling down here to my resource and I'm going to change all of these hard coded values to reference those in a data element. So I'm getting the publisher. I am going to get the uh, offer. Uh, the SKU, and also the version. And then all of that's there. What we can now do is we can run a Terraform plan and a Terraform apply to create those rules. All right, so let's run that Terraform plan. Terraform plan. And the plan is going to check my configuration and it's going to work out what changes need to be made. 
So here it's telling me that there's five resources to add. And we can see it's our virtual network, our subnet, the resource group, the network interface, and you can see here things like the source image reference, and there was kind of like a, we're referencing from our data element, the SSH key, which we're pulling in using the file function, and all of that looks good. So let's just run and apply and create those resources. Now Terraform Apply is also going to output that plan of changes just as a kind of a sanity check. I've already seen that, so I'm just answering yes. And Terraform now is using that provider to interface to Azure and it's going and it's creating all of those resources. And if we pop over to the Azure console, we'll actually be able to see those being created. So I'm just gonna go over to resource groups here and you can see here example resources that we've just kind of created. So now currently we've got the example network, which has been created, the NIC, and then eventually, well, we can see there the, the virtual machine has now been also created. So let's go back over to Terraform. And now it's done. We have that virtual machine created. All of the other resources have been set up and created inside of Azure and everything's good. So that configuration that we've just written has now resulted in cloud resources being created inside of Azure. So let's start digging a little bit further. The first thing we want to do is to be able to log into the virtual machine. So let's kind of have a look at how we can update some of our configuration to be able to do that. Now, first, we briefly mentioned functions. So let's have a look at functions a little bit more in depth and see how you can really leverage those to kind of make your configuration much more dynamic. Terraform is a concept of a function, and a function is something which is kind of like a, a mathematical operator. So you can see here the example is using max, and it will give me the max value from this, this kind of list of values. There are other numeric functions. I can get the, the absolute value of something. I can kind of get the, you know, floor something so I can get the, the sort of the, the major integer part of things. String functions, which allow me to do string substitution and things like that. And then there are more sort of specific functions like IP network functions. One of those IP network functions is CIDR subnet. And what CIDR subnet allows me to do is it allows me to take a subnet and, and calculate another subnet from it. So if we go back to our configuration, we were doing this kind of manually, but we can actually do this automatically using a function. Let's have a look. So here in the Azure subnet, we're using this address prefix. And this is kind of a hard-coded value, but we can use a function to replace this. So if we replace this with the CIDR subnet function, so CIDR subnet, and what we can then do is we can specify the, the original subnet, and that's going to be the open web UI address space. Now let's have a look at this. Now what you can see here is it's open UI web space. So this is actually a list. So by to get the first value in the list, I'm going to use the index position zero, and that's what's using these square brackets there. Then what we're going to do is we're going to control the number of bits that we want to add to this subnet. So we want a 24 bit. So we're going to add eight bits, and then we're going to specify the number of the range that we want. So the previous value that we had was 10.0.2.0 slash 24. So in order to do that, we're gonna use the second index and then that will give us the same value. So that's gonna now give us that subnet, which is 10.0.2.0 slash 24, which will give us an IP range of 10.0.2.0 to 10.0.2.255. There's many other functions that you can use inside of Terraform and I really recommend spending some time and looking at that documentation because they're incredibly useful. You've seen two so far. You've seen that file and you've seen CIDR subnet. And we're going to use this more as we kind of progress through the configuration. But first things first, let's kind of dig in. Now let's have a look at how we can authenticate to that machine, how we can log into it. So in order to log into a virtual machine in Azure, it needs to have an, a public IP assigned to it. So in order to do that, what we can do is we can use the public IP resource here. So you can see that we are going to define our public IP. We're going to call it Open Web UI Public IP. The location in the resource group we're referencing from our resource group. 
and we're doing an allocation method of static. So that's going to create us a public IP inside of Azure that we can then assign to a network interface. So our network interface here is Open Web UI. And what we can do is we can update this IP configuration and we can specify a public address IP. And then we're going to use the Azure um, public uh, address ID and we can reference that there. Now we've got that configured. So we've got the public I public address there assigned. We're creating the resource for the public IP. Let's have a look at how we can update some configuration and how Terraform manages that. So we've added some resources and we've made some changes to resources. So let's run a Terraform apply and see what happens. So what you can see here is it's saying that there's one to add, one to change, and one to destroy. So Terraform is smart enough to understand what already exists and which resources can be mutated and which resources need to be destroyed completely in order to be recreated. So we're going to add that public IP and we're going to update the network interface to assign the public IP. And that's all output here in the plan. So I'm just gonna click yes, we're gonna make those changes and then we should be able to log into our VM. Okay, so that's done. So now we can log into the virtual machine. One small problem. We don't know what the public IP is. So we could go over to the console. We could look it up in there, but there's actually a smarter way to do it. And that is that Terraform can actually output those things in the CLI when you define them as an output variable. Let's have a look at how we can create an output variable for that public IP. Now I'm adding these to this file here called output.tf, but it doesn't matter. You could put them anywhere in any file. It just helps, I think, to keep things nice and clean and, and separated. So let's look at an output variable. So an output variable looks like this. So we're using this output reference. We're giving it the name public IP. Now it doesn't have a type, so it, it's only the two parts there. And then you set the value. So the value again is using that interpolated value. And the value that we're going to use is the Azure RM public IP open web UI, which is the name of it. And then we're going to get the IP address of it. So we add that and save it. Let's run Terraform apply, and then we'll see that public IP output into the CLI. And there we go. So that was really quick because it didn't have to do anything. The, the public IP was already in Terraform's internal storage. So it just output it. So we can grab that value now and I can run that SSH command to get it. But there's also a better way to do this. Let's have a look at a little trick that I like to use when I log into an SSH of a machine. Now, to get the output variable, I don't have to run apply. What I can do is run Terraform output. And Terraform output is going to list all of those output variables that are specified. I can also specify an individual output variable by giving its name. So Terraform output public IP. So this now is just outputting the public IP. The thing that you need to note here is that it's in wrapping this in speech marks, and that's because the type is a string. So that Terraform doesn't wrap it in speech marks, what we can do is you can use the flag raw. So we're just using that there, flag raw. And now you can see Terraform is only outputting that public IP. So why do I care about this? What, what, what's important about being able to do this? Well, it, it shows me a nice little trick. So let me just grab this command. I'm gonna copy this here, and I'm just gonna clean my terminal. So I'm gonna do SSH, and then I'm going to do the name of the machine, the username that I need to connect, which is open web UI. And then I specify the, the at symbol, and the IP address that I want to connect to. So I could go Terraform output and I could copy and paste that IP address, or I can actually use a subshell. So I'm going to use a subshell here, which has my Terraform output command. Just going to press enter. You can see there that now the machine there is connecting to the host. Do I want to connect? Yes, I do. And there we go. We've connected up to our virtual machine. Everything's been provisioned, everything's been created. So far, so good. Let's now get into the really useful stuff. Let's see how we can actually provision an application to this virtual machine so that we can do something useful with it. First things first, let's clean up after ourselves. 
Now, if you remember from the basics video, there is a command called terraform destroy. And what terraform destroy is going to do is it's going to reverse any operation that you've done with apply. Any of the resources that you created with apply, destroy is going to remove. It's a safe command to run because when we've got this apply command, we can always recreate those resources. Now I have to say, you don't want to probably do this against your prod infrastructure. Destroying production infrastructure is going to leave you having a pretty bad day. But for our little demo application, it's a great way to kind of save money and save some time when we're kind of spinning these things up and down again. Let's just wait for that to finish. And that's done. So we've got six resources destroyed. If we have a look at the console again, and then let's just refresh this. And everything's gone. And in fact, if I go back to resource groups and then just refresh that as well, you can see that the, the overlying resource group has actually been deleted. Everything that I created with that Terraform code with the destroy command has been removed. Now let's have a look at how we can provision an application and do something useful with that virtual machine. Now in order to provision our application, what we're going to do is we're going to use a cloud init script. The Azure VM allows us to specify that cloud init script with this custom data parameter. So we're going to look at how we create that. So we need to build that cloud init bundle. And we could do this manually, but it's quite painful. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use another provider. We're going to use the cloud init provider. So the cloud init provider is actually implements a data source. And the data source here is cloud init config. It allows us to specify the parts that we need for our cloud init config, such as any scripts, the main configuration itself, and it will automatically gzip it and base64 encode the output that we can pass straight to that custom data. Let's have a look at how we set that up. And let's look at the configuration itself that we're going to use to provision our application. So like all providers, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add the cloud init provider there. And I've just grabbed that from the documentation. So we're going to use cloud init 2.2. Then what we can do is we can create that data element. Let's scroll up here and we're just going to add this up at the top. And we're just going to add our cloud init configuration. Let's have a look at what this is. So we're specifying that we want the bundle to be zipped, and we're specifying that we want that to be base64 encoded, which is the requirements for the, the, the custom data parameter inside the Linux virtual machine. Now we have to add two different parts here. The first part is going to be our init script. This is going to be the script which is going to install the various software that we need. And we also need the cloud config itself. Let's have a look at those two files. So the cloud init file, we're keeping this really, really basic. All we're going to do is we're going to run an update and an upgrade, and then we're going to run a command. The command that we're going to run is going to be this init script. Now the init script here, we're just referencing it from the default location whenever you add a script to a cloud init bundle, which we are doing inside of our data element. So you can see here, this part is defining the init script and it's a shell script. So that will be uploaded to this location here. Now let's have a look at this init script itself. And this, the script itself, what I'm doing is again, I'm using that file. So that, that kind of function inside of Terraform and I'm referencing provision basic. Now let's path a look at this path.module. So this path.module here that we're referencing with this dollar curly bracket. What we're doing is we're, we're interpolating inside of a string. And because we're interpolating inside of a string, I've got to wrap the requirement for that variable. In this instance, it's a special referenceable variable inside of Terraform path, which allow, gives me the absolute path of my current vm.tf file or the, the, the directory that contains it, in fact. And then what I can do is I can reference the relative part, which is scripts provision basic. The total of this is going to be an absolute path. So I don't need to worry about any form of directory changes or anything like that. It's going to be calculated dynamically for me. So we're loading that into the content. Let's look at this file itself. So provision basic, let's see what is going on here. So provision basic is just a bash script. We're using the set E so it makes sure that if any command fails, the entire script will fail, it won't continue. 
And we're specifying that we want the Debian front end to be non-interactive. So any apt install that we do, which has any sort of UIs or anything like that, will, will be bypassed. I'm then just doing an update and I'm installing a couple of packages. What I'm installing is CA certificates, I'm installing curl, SQLite, and Apache 2 utils. And I'll show you where I need those in a little bit. Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set up and install Docker. And this all comes from Docker's install instructions. So we're just adding the Docker GPG key. We're adding the apt repo. And then what we're going to do is just that update. And then we're installing the Docker CE, the CE, CLI, and the various other different bits and pieces that we need in order to run Docker. The reason that I want to run Docker is because I'm going to use that because my application that I'm going to run, Open Web UI, comes packaged as a Docker container. So this is actually a really nice segue to show you what we're going to do. So we're going to use Open Web UI. And what Open Web UI allows us to do is it allows us to interface with an LLM that might be running locally, or it allows us to interface with an Open AI API, such as Open AI's paid offering. Now we can kind of use this to create our own environment where we can play around and experiment with, with LLMs, where we can also run them locally so that we can do private RAG-based integrations. But it's just a nice little application to show you how to provision something to a virtual machine. It's also very useful. I use this all the time and I really love this application. So big shout out to the team who created Open Web UI. So as I mentioned earlier, what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the Docker integration for Open Web UI. And we're going, to, we're going to run this as a Docker container. Let's have a look back at our configuration script and we'll see what we're going to do there. So we've already installed Docker. What we're now going to do is we're going to create a folder for our Open Web UI configuration because across various different restarts, we want to be able to persist the configuration and the databases and things like that for Open Web UI. Docker containers are immutable by default, but if you map a volume to the host's volume, then you can actually store some of those configurations and databases which you need across those various restarts. So we're doing that. We're going to set this. Now we need to authenticate to Open Web UI. So what we're going to do is we're going to pre-configure a username. By default, when you start Open Web UI, it will allow you to create that administrator account. So what we're doing here is we're taking our default password, my password. Now I've already mentioned that hard coding credentials and things like that in your Terraform configuration is bad. We will look at how we make this dynamic in just a moment. But we've got that password. Then we're using the HT password command in order to create that Apache password configuration version of my password, which we can then inject into Open Web UI's database. The username, I'm hard coding again to admin at demo.js. And then what we're going to do is we're going to first start Open Web UI. That is then going to prepare any of the default files. It's going to create the, the base authentication database. And then we're just going to wait for that to start, wait for everything to be reconfigured, and then we can stop it, clean up. And then what we're actually then going to do is we're going to update the Open Web UI database using this SQL statement here. This is then going to create our administration user using the details that we just created previously. And then, of course, we're all good. So by default, Open Web UI is using this SQL Lite database for its, all of its configuration. This is why we're just running the SQLite command here. And all of this information comes from the Open Web UI documentation. Finally, what we're going to now do is we're just going to clean up that Web UI SQL file, which has our password in it. And then we're going to create a systemd unit that we can use to start Open Web UI whenever the virtual machine starts. And again, very, very straightforward. Standard system D, nothing specific to Terraform here. We're just creating that unit. We're going to call it Open Web UI. It's going to have a dependency on Docker, so it will only start after Docker has started. And then the service configuration here is going to just do a Docker run. We're mapping the default Open Web UI port of 8080 to port 80. We are going to automatically update our RAG models, which is just an environment configuration. And then we're mapping the directory that we created earlier, so the one which contains the authentication database and the various other configuration to the disk of the virtual machine. I'm going to specify a name for my container, and I can use this percentage n, which is a special systemd 
configuration, which allows me just to get the name of the unit. And then we'll see how that works and see that it gets named exactly the same as the systemd service. And then all we're going to do is we're going to reload our systemd daemon. We're going to enable the open web UI service and we're going to start it. So when the cloud init script runs, this will only run once when the virtual machine is created. It's going to install Docker. It's going to configure open web UI, setting our username and password. It's then going to set that system D unit, which will then be started, and then everything will be up and running. So now let's add that cloud init script to the virtual machine. So let's just pop over to the virtual machine's configuration. And we're just going to scroll down here to find our VM. And then just down at the bottom, what we're going to do is we're going to specify custom data. And we are going to reference our cloud config, and we're using the rendered property. So this is going to give us a gzipped and base64 encoded version of our cloud init bundle, which we pass to custom data. Whenever the virtual machine now starts, that cloud init script will run. Our provision basic script will execute. Everything will be installed, and we're all good. Previously, when we kind of ran this, the virtual machine came up immediately. There was no delays. But now, because we're installing some software, it's going to be a little bit slower. So how do we know when it's complete? Well, we don't. And this is the key thing, that the way that the Azure provider works is that the virtual machine is going to start. The second that the cloud init script runs, the Terraform is going to announce that it has been created. When in fact, it hasn't quite finished doing its setup because the Azure API doesn't tell Terraform when the cloud init script is finished. So let's have a look at a way that we can kind of delay the output of Terraform so that we know that only when the virtual machine is up and when the cloud init script is running, that we're, we're good to go. So how can we do that? How can we delay the return of the Terraform apply command until we're confident that our virtual machine is up and running? Well, when the virtual machine application is completed, port 80 will have an application running on it. So in a, in a kind of a, so if I was running locally, I could just curl that IP address, and I could see that once I get a response and a 200 response, then I know my application is up and running. From Terraform, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a provider, and I'm going to use the TerraCurl provider that's created by my good friend DevOps Rob. So the TerraCurl provider gives you all of the capabilities of curl, but it kind of wraps it up in Terraform configuration, so I can then use it from inside my config. I can do a lot of different things with this, but, but in essence, one of the things that it allows me to do is it allows me to continually retry until it gets a success. And that's part of those parameters. So let, let's configure this up. Let's see how this is going to work. So like everything, what I do is I'm just going to grab that required provider information. And I'm going to paste that into my config. So it's pasting that into the configuration there. Then I can add the TerraCurl block. So let's just do that. So the TerraCurl stanza is going to look like this. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a TerraCurl request. The name is just open web UI. And then the URL that I am going to execute is going to just be a GET request, and it's going to be on the public IP that we created earlier. So once the application is running, this is going to return me a 200. So what I'm going to check with TerraCurl is I'm going to say, right, I want or I expect a response code of 200. I want you to keep retrying for 120 times at an interval of 10 seconds until you get that 200. So that's basically going to block Terraform until it gets that 200 response, or the max retry has exceeded. And in this instance, it's going to be around 20 minutes that we're going to block for. It's a really nice way to kind of just check or, or to do any API-based configuration. Terraform curl obviously supports post and puts and any of the other sort of HTTP verbs. So it, it's great for this purpose. Let's run that Terraform apply, and then let's create those resources. So let's first run a Terraform init to install TerraCurl, and then we can run that apply. Terraform init, that's going to go, it's going to find that it needs to install TerraCurl. It's installing the correct version, and now we can run an apply, which is going to create those resources for us. So we are generating that cloud init configuration. We can see that we're now adding seven resources, um, TerraCurl and cloud init and things like that. I'm answering yes to that. And Terraform is now going to go away and it's going to create those. Now, this is going to take a little bit longer than it did before because now we're waiting to provision that application. 
But let's just wait for that to finish and then we'll see what's going on. Okay, so we can see now that that's completed. Let's just grab that IP address and then let's log in. So that's the open web UI up and running there. So the application's now been provisioned. It's not particularly useful. I don't wanna log in just yet because I wanna make some slight changes. One of the things that I want to be able to do is make this dynamic. So I want to be able to make that password automatically generated. I wanna be able to pass the username in as a dynamic variable. So we're gonna see how to do that right now. There's one more thing that I want to be able to add, and that is I want to be able to configure this application to be able to use an open AI API key so that I can use then open web UI to, to interface with the open AI API. All of that we're gonna do by making the configuration dynamic with variables and how we're gonna use the template file capability to be able to generate that cloud in its script in a more dynamic way and to be able to use those variables. So let's dig in and let's see how we can make this work. So in order to make configuration for Terraform dynamic, we use a concept called a variable. And a variable allows us to modify a value either at runtime or we can set a default value that can be used within the configuration. Let's have a look at this. So let's create a variable for the Open Web UI admin user. So we're gonna do this using this variable declaration here. And the variable here is variable, and we're specifying the name, which is Open Web UI user, and a description. So the description can be useful because it can give a hint to what the variable can be used for. There's also a lot of capabilities where we can do things with validation, but we're concentrating on the basics. So we have the default value, and default value is optional. I'm setting this to admin at demo.js, which means that Terraform is not gonna automatically prompt me to specify it. If I didn't set a default value, then Terraform will raise an error and it'll tell me that I need to provide a value for this particular variable. Let's add some more variables, which are going to be for our OpenAI key. And with this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna specify the OpenAI base. So that's the base URL or the OpenAI API. And we're just gonna set that to the default because that's using the default version for OpenAI. Then what we want to be able to do is we wanna set the OpenAI key. So the OpenAI key, we're not setting a default. So how can we set this? Well, we can set a variable in a number of different ways. We can do it with the Terraform CLI. So I could write a command like this, Terraform apply, and then I could do var, and I could do open AI key, and then I could specify the value of the key. And I could specify it like that. So I can do that on my CLI. The other way that I can do it is that I can provide an environment variable, which will automatically set a Terraform variable. Let's look at this way and how we can do it. So I'm back just looking at my environment script here. So what I can do is I can prefix an environment variable with tf underscore var underscore and then the following part of the environment variable name can be the Terraform variable. So in this instance, I create an environment variable tf underscore var open API key. And what that will do is Terraform will automatically assign that environment variable to this Terraform variable. And that happens automatically whenever I run Terraform apply, destroy, or plan. Again, I'm just using one password. I've got the key stored in there so I can use my my little command here, which just fetches that out and sets that environment variable. But that's, that's as simple as, as is. So now we've got those set, what we can now do is we can look at how we can configure that template to be dynamic as well, so that we can inject those into our cloud init script. So if we just look at the data source for creating our cloud init config, we can see that we're using this file and all file is doing is it's just loading that script from disk. So we're loading provision basic from, from script. Now, what I want to be able to do is I want to make this a little bit more dynamic. So I want to inject some variables into this. Well, I can use a different function and the different function that I'm going to use is called template file. So let's just change this template file. And then what template file takes is two different properties. So it's going to take the path of the file that we want, and then it takes a, a block of a Terraform variables that we can use to kind of make that configuration dynamic and it'll get interpolated at runtime. So we're gonna keep this template file here. Now I'm gonna just change this to provision vars. And provision vars is just a copy of my basic script that I was using earlier. 
Then what I want to do is I want to configure which variables I can use from within the script. So let's just add that. And what we're going to do is we're going to add this block. Now IntelliSense has actually completed this for me, but what I'm doing here is I'm going to make the variables open web UI user, open AI base and open AI key available to the template file function. So template file cannot automatically just read every variable that's inside of Terraform. You have to specify which ones are available. And I do that by creating this object here and by assigning the values from my variables to these keys. Once I've done that, what I can do is I can then start using these values inside of my configuration. So let's have a look at doing that. Let's go over to our vars and let's start making it dynamic. So let's see how we can use this template file and how we can use those variables. I'm just going to scroll down here and I'm going to find my user that's hard coded. And I'm just going to change this and I'm changing this to open web UI and it is user. So what I'm doing is I'm using this dollar curly bracket and this is the replacement syntax for template file. It's going to replace the value of open web UI, which I'm setting here, and it's going to replace it with the, the absolute value. So it's kind of that, that escape syntax. One thing you need to note about this is that this is actually the same syntax as using things like variable substitution inside of bash. So earlier on, when we were using that variable substitution to inject the username and the password into our SQL script, which configures the, the admin user, this is actually going to now fail because template file is going to try and treat this as a, an internal re replacement. So in order to bypass that, what we can do is we can just add a an additional escape here. So we're just escaping that with an additional dollar. And now template file is just going to treat that as a bash environment variable and not its own substitution replacement. So that's something that's important. It's quite a, something might catch you out if you're taking a standard template and you're trying to kind of make it more dynamic. Next, let's have, see how we can use the open AI keys. So I'm going to add a new block here. And the new block that I'm going to add is like this. So you can see that instead of using dollar and curly bracket, I'm now using percentage and curly bracket. And this is the template file syntax for using conditionals. So here I have if open AI key, so the variable that I'm passing into the template file, open AI key, and I'm saying, if it's not blank, then what I want to do is I want to echo open AI key and the value into this file here. And what this is actually doing is setting up an environment file that systemd is going to use. So I can dynamically create that environment file and I can write those environment variables to it. I can then use those within my systemd job. So we're going to do this. Note here also that we have this end if. Again, that's part of the conditional statement. All of that's available in the documentation for template file. And you can see how you can also use like loops and things like that inside of there. Let's just keep going. Let's have a look at modifying that systemd unit to now use these environment variables. So I'm just going to add a new section here and I'm adding environment file and I'm specifying the path to this environment file that we're creating there. What I also want to be able to do is I now want to be able to use those two variables, AI key and AI base. And I do that just by specifying them here. So open AI key and open AI base. What I've done there is I've set that to automatically have the dash E. So the dash E is the Docker command, which adds an environment variable to the, the Docker command. We're, we're doing it this way so that we can make this fully dynamic because if open AI key is not set, then when we run this systemd command, it'll just completely be fine. So if we don't specify a, a value for the open AI key or we set a specify a blank value, it'll be okay. This is not going to cause any errors. Now there's one last thing that I want to address with this, and that was the password. So we're still hard coding the password. We could pass the password as a variable, but there's another and even better way to do it, and that is to use another Terraform provider. Terraform's got a great thing called the random provider, which allows you to do things like generate random numbers and, of course, random passwords. Let's have a look at it. 
So the random provider that you see here has got a number of different resources. We have random bytes, random ID, integer, password, pet, shuffle, string. We're going to use random password. Random password is going to allow us to generate random passwords, which have got a particular length. They can use special characters, and you can even specify which special characters you want for your password. I'm going to just use this. So let's grab that again from the provider block. We're just going to grab random, and we're going to add that to our configuration. So we're just going to add this into our required providers block. We're going to save that. And then we can now go and create that random password. So let's just add that up to the top here, just after, just after this block here. And we're going to add that. And we're going to create random password. We're calling it password. It's going to be 16 characters in length, and we're not going to use any special characters. So to use that, what we're going to do is we're going to update template file, and we're going to add an open uh, web UI password, and we're setting that to the result of our random password. So that's going to be whatever this random password resource generates. Whenever we run, we can set that there. So now we can update our configuration script again, our init script to use that. So let's just go over here and then let's replace my password with open web UI password. Now the configuration is fully dynamic. We're injecting the password, we're injecting the username, and we're also injecting the OpenAI key and the base. One last thing that we need to do before we run this, and that is that we need to add an output variable so that we can actually get that password. So let's just do that. We're just gonna add a new output variable. Um, this one is just gonna be the password there. Now we're specifying this as sensitive to be true. And what that means is that whenever you run Terraform apply, it's not going to put that value out in plain text. It's going to only allow you to get the value if you explicitly state Terraform output and then password. It's, it's kind of a nice way to make sure that you're not leaking any sensitive output variables in any CI, CD or any processes like logs or anything. That's there and that's all done. Now we can run Terraform apply and we can update our script. Now, before we run Terraform apply, we've added a new provider. So let's run Terraform in it. That's now going to download those missing provider plugins. Everything's good there. Now we can run Terraform apply. So let's look at this. Now we've got an error message here. And what it's saying is it's saying control keyword HTTP code is not a valid template control keyword. Let's have a look at that area of our configuration script and let's see what's going on. So it's said here that we need to look at line, line 47. Let's have a look, line 47 or in its script. And what we have there, you can see that we're using percentage, curly bracket, and HTTP code. Now, if you remember earlier on, I was talking about the substitution for these usernames and that the template file is using this syntax of dollar curly bracket, and percentage curly bracket as its own internal replacement mechanisms for either a conditional statement or for variable substitution. It's saying here that HTTP code is not a conditional statement or a loop. It's not a, a function that it knows about. And that's because we need to replace that here again, and we just need to escape it. So the curl command uses this, uh, this template capability of percentage curly bracket that conflicts with template files syntax. So just by adding the additional percentage in front there, it's going to escape it and then everything will work just fine. So now we can run apply again, Terraform apply. We're adding two resources and we're changing or destroying one resource. So we're going to add two resources. And we're going to destroy. Let's have a look at what's going on in the plan here. So we're adding that random password. We are also going to destroy or replace our virtual machine. And let's have a look at why. So we're going to replace the virtual machine. And Terraform is telling us that because we're changing the custom data, because we're changing the cloud in its script, this is not something that can be updated in place. It has to completely destroy the virtual machine and replace it again. That's great. And then let's scroll up. And we can see that also our cloud init script has changed. 
And this is what's going to happen. So Terraform is smart enough to understand what can be updated, what already exists, and what doesn't need to be recreated, but also what needs to be destroyed and recreated because a property has been changed that can't be mutated. I'm just going to answer yes to this, and we're going to wait for this to complete, and we'll see that new script with our new dynamic credentials, and we'll be able to log in and have a little bit of a play with Open Web UI. So now that's completed, let's grab that IP address and let's log into that virtual machine. So I'm just going to log in here. So it's admin at demo.js and then the password I need to get from Terraform. We do Terraform output password. That gives me that password there. Let me just copy this and paste it into that open web UI box, sign in, and we can see everything's working. Now the models, because we've configured that open AI API, we can use any of the open AI models. So let's use GPT-4. Let's have a look here and let's ask GPT about Terraform variables. What are variables in Terraform? So it's saying that variables in Terraform are parameters for Terraform modules, which is, which is correct. Let's ask it if there are any specific types of modules. How do I define a specific type for a Terraform variable? So what it's now telling me is that whilst we've been defining variables as just plain strings, we can actually define variables as more complex types. We can have numbers, booleans, list, maps, and all sorts of things like that. Let's have a look at how we can do that. Let's now we'll take a quick look at how we can make the configuration even a little bit more dynamic using complex variable types and how we can create a GPU enabled virtual machine so that we can actually run local versions of LLMs rather than interfacing with GPT. Let's now introduce two new variables. And the first one's gonna be a complex variable. So let me just set this up here. So we're gonna introduce a new variable called machine. Now. Machine is going to be a map. So we're going to be able to specify GPU, and then we're going to specify the type, which is this GPU enabled type inside of Azure. And then if we have the map key as CPU, we can also have the type as the standard A2 that we've been using. What I want to be able to do is I want to use a conditional statement inside of my configuration to so that if I'm using GPU enabled, I can select the right machine type. Let's add another variable here, and we're going to call this one GPU enabled. So whenever I set GPU enabled in my Terraform apply configuration, I'm going to select one of this, these types. So let's, let's look at that. So at the moment, what we're doing is we're hard coding the size for the virtual machine. Let's see how we can use a conditional statement based on variables. So what we're going to do is we're going to say var GPU enabled, and then we're going to say, that using this, this conditional statement here, I'm gonna say, well, if GPU is enabled, what I want to do is I wanna use machine and I wanna use the GPU key and I wanna specify the type. And then if we're not using GPU enabled, we're gonna use the type from the CPU. And because machine is a map in this particular variable type, I can actually use the dot notation to access the individual keys and then set the values there. Let's now go a little bit further. Let's add the GPU drivers to our cloud init script so that we can set up all of that and then to make open web UI be able to use Docker enabled GPU. So we're just gonna go over to our VARS script and we're gonna just scroll down here just behind where we were setting the open AI key. What we're gonna do is we're gonna set a, a new block here. So again, I'm using that conditional statement capability with inside of template file. And I'm saying if GPU enabled, what I'm gonna do is I'm adding a new environment variable GPU flag, which enables the GPU for Docker. And then I'm also going to download the NVIDIA drivers. I'm going to install all of those. And I'm also going to add the NVIDIA container toolkit. And that enables me to use the NVIDIA GPU that's attached to this machine with Docker. So we're adding that there. We just need to make a change to our systemd unit and we're going to add GPU flag. This is all good. One last thing, 
The GPU driver, whenever we're installing that, the machine needs to be rebooted. So rather than just starting the service here, let's just reboot this machine. This script is now completed. When we're using a GPU enabled virtual machine, we're going to install those drivers, set the flag, and we're going to reboot the machine as necessary. I do need to add that additional flag to my template. So let's just scroll up and add that here. And we're just going to say GPU enabled, and we're setting that to our variable. And then that's all good. Everything is now correct and set. We can now rerun Terraform Apply. We're going to enable GPU by setting the variable GPU enabled to be true. And we're going to create ourselves a GPU enabled virtual machine this time. So Terraform apply var GPU enabled equals true. And now let's run this. So you can see that we're just doing that check again. It's going to kind of determine that we were adding one resource and it's going to destroy one resource. Let's have a look at this because there's actually a small issue with this configuration, something that we need to make a little tweak to. You can see that what's being changed is that the virtual machine is going to be changed. Now, the problem with this is that we are using the TerraCurl resource after the virtual machine has been changed to determine when our application is ready and up and running. If we look at the TerraCurl request, what you can see is that we're not referencing the virtual machine in interpolation, but we're actually referencing the public IP. What that means is that in terms of the Terraform graph, the TerraCurl request will be created after the public IP has been created. And whenever the public IP changes, the TerraCurl request will also change and be destroyed and recreated. If the virtual machine changes and the public IP doesn't, then the TerraCurl request won't be changed. To deal with this, Terraform has got some special metadata types that allow you to be able to kind of have those dependent changes. And this specific one is called Lifecycle. If you look at the docs, now Lifecycle is classified as a meta argument. Now a meta argument is available to every resource. It doesn't matter which provider it's in. It's a standard Terraform capability. So lifecycle, we can define things like create before destroy. And what that would do is that would create a resource before it destroys the old one. If you're replacing a virtual machine, sometimes this is the behavior that you would like. Another option is that we can do things like prevent destroy. So we can ensure that you can't accidentally remove a resource and we can specify ignore changes. Sometimes we don't want a resource to be destroyed when a dependency changes. What we can also do, though, is we can specify replace triggered by. So this means that if a particular resource, which is not a direct dependency changes, then this resource will also change. So our example, we want to change our TerraCurl resource whenever the virtual machine's ID changes or the virtual machine changes. So let's use that. Let's use replace triggered by and then let's reference that virtual machine and we'll see that the difference in the plan there. So back over to my configuration and I am doing replace triggered by and then what I'm going to specify here is our virtual machine. So it's uh, Azure Linux virtual machine open web UI. So now whenever the open web UI virtual machine changes, this TerraCurl request will also change. Let's run that apply again. You'll see that. So I'm just going to clear this. Terraform apply. And now what you see is that two resources are going to be added and two are going to be destroyed. And those two resources are that TerraCurl request and our virtual machine because we added that dependency. Nine times out of 10, Terraform is fine with interpolation, but occasionally you will find that you have a dependency which is not direct. So our virtual machine dependency is not directly linked to TerraCurl but it is important to have that link there. So using the meta arguments is one way to kind of work around this. Let's just answer yes. Let's create our virtual machine with a GPU, and then let's see how we can use that Olama locally. Okay, so let's create that. So we're gonna do Terraform apply var, we're setting GPU enabled to be true. Terraform is now going to tell us that it should be creating and destroying two resources, the virtual machine and TerraCurl. 
which we can see is happening here. And this is all correct. So let's answer yes to this. Let's wait for this to finish. And then let's see what we can do by running local LLMs on our new GPU enabled virtual machine. Because we're now using a GPU enabled virtual machine, we can actually run those large language models locally using Olama. So let's do that. Let's try and run Mistral locally, and then let's ask it a question, see how it compares to GPT. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to specify the model Mistral, and I'm going to pull that from olama.com. So this is going to take a couple of seconds to download. So Mistral's now downloaded. Let's select it and give it a go. So we're going to choose Mistral latest there. How do I clean up Terraform resources? Let's see what Mistral's got to say about that. So Mistral's telling me that I can actually run Terraform Workspace Select if I'm using Terraform Workspaces. We haven't covered that in this video, but they are it is a useful command and useful tool. And it's also suggesting that what I should do is I should run a plan dash destroy to kind of see what the impact of my action is going to be. And of course, run destroy. But you know, pretty good. That's a local language model. That's not using GPT. That is using the, the latest version of Mistral. Let's run that. Let's run that Terraform destroy. Let's clean up all of our stuff. And then let's have a look at what we've learned today so far. So I'm just running that command, Terraform destroy. Now, I hope you've seen that by configuring your virtual machines and by setting everything up, using Terraform, it actually makes the whole process reproducible. I've created and destroyed VMs a number of different times in this very short demo. And it's great because it enables me to kind of save a little bit of money. If I just want to use a virtual machine with a GPU attached for a couple of hours, I don't have to leave it running for weeks and weeks because it takes me so long to set up and configure all of that software. I can just set it up, prepare my Terraform script, create it, and when I'm done, I destroy it, and then we're all good. Let's have a little summary of what you've learned so far. So we've looked at how you register providers with Terraform and why it's important to kind of pin that version to make sure that your configuration is matched to the current version of the provider that you're using. You make sure that when you make a change, it's your control. I can guarantee you providers don't change and break that often, but the time you find out it has changed and it has broken your configuration would be the time that you need it the most. It'll be 3 a.m. when you're trying to kind of get something done to provision some resources. It's good practice to pin versions and to always keep to the latest version. That way you're making sure you've got the latest version of the provider, the latest functionality and the resources that are available and all of the bugs have been squashed. We've also looked at the provider configuration, and you've seen that for Azure, we need to set certain variables. We need the client ID, the subscription ID, the tenant ID, and the client secret. And you've seen that we can create those by using the Azure console to create an app registration and generate that client ID in secret. We've looked at variables. You've seen that variables can be fairly straightforward. They can just be these simple strings, but also we can have Boolean values and we can have more complex types like maps. We've also seen how that can be used internally for your applications and how you can use interpolation values and things like that and conditional statements to be able to assign variables and use them. We've looked at templates and we've seen how you can provision an application using cloud in it. We've looked at a sort of a very basic script, but then also looking at how we can make that more dynamic by using some of those variables that you've, you've injected in. And we've also looked at output variables. Outputs being able to provide things like dynamic passwords that we're creating, the public IP for our virtual machine. And that kind of ties into that core workflow and, and how we can use it to be able to do things like log into the virtual machine. I hope this has been useful. It's just been a very kind of quick introduction to how to use Terraform with Azure. There's a lot more resources out there, and we will link some of those things down below. But now you can find the source code for this in GitHub, and, and I kind of encourage you to kind of have a play around with that. Give it a try out, do some experimentation, maybe provision something different. You don't have to use Open Web UI. You can use any application you want. But for now, this is all for me. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.